Hey guys, Josh Schenken here, creator of the Ultimate Sandbag Core Training System. I'm not big on rants and raves and screaming at cameras and people, but I am concerned about different trends and fads that are going on in our industry. One thing I want to address is a really common mistake that us as coaches and fitness enthusiasts make, and that is losing sight of what we're trying to accomplish and not using specific systems to try to achieve our overall goals. What am I talking about? One of the biggest questions I get with our Ultimate Sandbag program is, can I deadlift a sandbag? Can I swing a sandbag? In essence, what people want to do is they want to use the sandbag for things they're already like doing. I really don't like people using equipment just for variety's sake, just to be different to be different. If you have a system in place of how you organize your training, you'll understand when it is vital and when it is appropriate to use different exercises and different implements. For example, in our lift certification, we teach you a progressional system of when to implement different variations of movements. If you're just looking to teach a deadlift, what's the best implement to use? Probably a barbell. However, there are times that a sandbag or a kettlebell could be more appropriate. But if you don't have the system in place to understand who it's right for and when it is appropriate to be used, you're really lost in your training program. So what we're going to do in a moment is we're going to take you through a series of videos showing you the difference in different movements and overall programming. What I really want to emphasize is that our program is a system, meaning that there's deliberate meaning behind everything we do. For example, when people go, Josh, I want to develop really big power. That's really vague. That's about as good as saying, I want to get in great shape. Power has to be in the context of what you're trying to achieve. Is it for a specific sport? What's the sport? What are we trying to achieve power for and how are we going to do that? For example, we're going to share you some drills that really helped an elite powerlifter and a judo athlete. Both very different types of athletes, but both found success with some of our drills because it gave them a different perspective of how to perform exercise. So stay tuned as we go through our series of really developing systems for elite performance. Okay guys, what I want to start with is everyone's sort of infatuation with both deadlifts and swings. These are two great exercises to perform. What we're ultimately trying to accomplish is we're trying to teach bilateral hip extension. We're trying to do that primarily with our posterior chain, hamstring, glute, and low back as an isometric contraction. But we actually have a lot more going on because we have to consider also the ground reaction forces, what our body is applying to the ground. That's something that gets lost in many of these discussions, but if you look at sporting performance and power generation, usually what you're looking at is how we're applying force to the ground, say? So we don't want to just get infatuated with the muscles being used, but the overall movement we're trying to accomplish. Why has everyone fell in love with the deadlift? It's a great drill of teaching a functional position of lifting something off the ground, something we do quite often. So what's the difference between, let's say, the deadlift and the swing? Well, with the swing, for example, we're going to have different angles and we're going to have different forces. For example, a lot of people forget that the force velocity curve of eccentric muscle action, basically lowering the weight versus raising the weight, is reversed. So, in the eccentric muscle action, the faster we move, the higher forces we produce, which is opposite what happens during concentric muscle action. So, the faster we move, the less force we produce. Okay? So, when you're doing a swing, the downward part of the swing is actually probably the most powerful part of the movement because you have the highest eccentric forces happening with the greatest speed. You're also going to have different hip and joint angles that's going to influence the movement differently. However, they are kind of similar because many of the positions are very familiar to each other. However, you have different stresses that go along with each exercise. So let's go break down the fact that a deadlift and a swing can be very different movements. So what we want to do is we also want to look at, can you deadlift with a sandbag? Is that a good exercise? Because we get that a lot, even with our heavier bags. For one is, the sandbag can never load itself to be as heavy as a barbell. Even though they are different implements and a lighter sandbag can feel as heavy as a heavier barbell, there's a limitation eventually to how much one can deadlift. Where it is appropriate is in the beginning stages of teaching posture and positioning. So if I take our ultimate sandbag here, what allows us to do is, in a neutral grip, it's easier to pinch our shoulder blades back and get our lats activated. Because where people lose it in the beginning stages of learning the deadlift is basically the thoracic spine. If the shoulders go, what happens to the upper back? The shoulders roll with it, the low back will round as well. So it's great to teach proper positioning of the deadlift. Now, what you'll notice 
is with the sandbags, I don't go as low as the bar typically does either. So this is also great for people that might have range of motion problems. However, I don't want to spend too much time on this specific lift because there are better implements such as the bar to do, you know, progressively have your deadlift exercise with. Same thing with the swing though, I want to look at, can I swing a, a sandbag? I can, but it's going to move a lot and it's probably not the ideal uh, implement of choice. So what I can do is I can change the position of the sandbag for both of these drills, meaning I have to look at different angles that are going to be challenged in both sport and everyday life. So not everyone is going to lift in a perfectly balanced position. So first thing we like to do is get in a staggered stance. So we can alter the movement and change the perceived load that we're using by going to a staggered stance. So toe up, toe in relationship to heel. I come here, I'm now predominantly using my left leg to lift the weight up. Why is this a great exercise? Is that we're progressively getting to single leg exercises. Now, if you have a system like we talked about, you're going to learn that changing body position has to be as incremental as you would in changing load. If you change body position too drastically, the perceived load and stability challenges are going to be too difficult for the individual. So over time, we can extend that further and further back till we're doing a true single leg deadlift. And these single leg exercises are really important because they expose our imbalances far greater than we can mask in our bilateral lifts. Additionally, I can change the placement of the load in relationship to my body. Both the kettlebell and the barbell were predominantly in front of the body. But that's not always where force and load comes from. Sometimes it's going to come from different angles. So one of the exercises that we love to do is a rotational deadlift. And world champion powerlifter Ellen Stein claimed that this really helped her sciatic pain in her hip and really allowed her to deadlift a lot more weight and power without pain. And that's a big deal. Why is that? It's because of the mobility we're giving to the hip. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin the bag on the side of the body. Already, I'm going to have a lateral stability component to this drill, which is different than when I do swings and deadlifts. I'm now going to internally rotate and pivot my foot. Now, Ellen came up with a great cue for this. You want to think about putting out the cigarette. So you're not passively just turning your foot. You're actively digging in the ground. I start to load my hip closest to the back. Now, you're going to grab on the back. You don't want to round the back still. I'm going to push to the left leg, simultaneously pivoting the right foot to both feet are flat. I then rotate to the opposing side. Push to the right hip, come up, push through both legs, back down the other side. In our New York lift certification, we had a judo athlete who found that her sciatic pain went away also just by doing this drill a few times because of the mobility it gives to the hip. So if you've been spending a lot of time doing swings and deadlifts, this is a great drill to implement as a complementary system. So from there, we can do multiple things as well. We can change body position again. So again, I can go staggered. Now, I'm not going to do the same pivoting action. I'm not going to have to rely on my hip mobility and my stability to produce the movement. Meaning I'm going to come back, weight back, pivot up, and then right back down. So now I'm getting forces both lateral, or we want to say frontal plane, as well as sagittal plane. So now these are becoming multi-planar drills. And again, I can progressively change the stability component and getting a more dynamic lunge, which is the beginning of a rotational lunge. These single leg drills are often overlooked, or the progressions of them, because people still think because we can lift more weight with a bilateral lift, they're not as important. But research shows that muscle activity and power development are significantly different and higher with single leg exercises. So you could almost think at some point your bilateral lifts are going to be a lesser exercise because you're going to need to progress to these unilateral drills for ultimately elite performance and fitness. So stay tuned as we attack some other drills in both pressing, squatting, and pulling.